Hi programmers, welcome to my guide to how grandma 2 effects really work. If you're struggling with some aspect of the math of effects, I think this video is going to help clear some of that up for you. This was another topic requested by a viewer. If you've got something that you want me to cover, leave it in the comments below, or you can always message me at console trainer on Facebook or Instagram. There's going to be a lot of info in this tutorial. This video is really for those of us who are already using, editing, and creating effects, but want to dive deeper into how the math actually works so that we can get the most out of this super powerful tool. The mathematical concepts can be a little advanced, but don't worry. Honestly, I suck at math. So I'm going to explain how all this math works with real life examples, because that's how I, someone who sucks at math, has taught myself to understand this stuff. And keep in mind that ultimately, effect math is just being applied to a DMX channel. It's running values between zero and 255. And that math does not care at all about the physics of your units. For example, maybe you've made a nice gracefully crossfading dimmer effect and you want to apply it to some LED fixtures that don't have the best of low end dimmer curves. If the fixture can't do a nice crossfade, there's no amount of math that's going to make that happen. The math also doesn't compensate for things like the actual speed that your moving heads can move at. You may have set a movement effect for 120 beats per minute to match the rate of your song, but more likely than not, your lights are not going to be able to complete that full movement at that frequency. So what I'm getting at here is even if you have a really good handle on how the math works, ultimately you got to see what your lights do in real life and how the math translates or doesn't, and then just adjust from there. And don't necessarily trust your visualizer either. That's a whole other type of math with lots of setting options that don't exactly equate to real life. Okay, let's start with just a quick review of the first couple of cells of a grandma 2 effect. A quantity of none makes this a template effect that can be applied to any fixture that contains an attribute used in the attribute column. If you add a selection of lights here, the effect becomes selective, meaning it's specific to those units and I very much recommend using selective effects when storing into queues. Interleave picks an interval of your selection to actually apply the effect to. For example, an odd or even interleave over a selection line of six would only apply that effect to every other light in the selection. Attribute designates the type of channel that the effect is being applied to, whether it's dimmer, pan, tilt, color, etc. Mode has two options, absolute or relative. Our effects run between two points and they can be specific values if the effect is absolute, or they can be relative to a starting value established outside the effect. I'll use some examples of both in this video and explain how they affect what the low and high value cells do. The form column is the most important part of an effect. It's the waveform that we're going to apply to a channel and modify. The MA includes a bunch of predefined waves and you can even make your own. But first, let's go back to when we were kids and review what we learned about waveforms. Here's a basic sine wave. This horizontal line is what we called the resting position in school. These high and low points of the wave were called the crest and trough and amplitude was the distance between that resting position and the crest or the trough. Wavelength was often measured over two complete waveforms using the distance between crests or troughs as our two points, but this can also be measured as the distance of one complete waveform, which is going to suit our understanding the best. Frequency equals the number of waves in a specific amount of time. Most of the time, this interval was expressed in hertz. Hertz is just cycles per second, so if this drawing represented one second and we see two waveforms, then our frequency is 2 Hz. In our world, cycles per second is not used nearly as much as BPM or beats per minute, so let's consider our timing intervals to be a minute rather than a second. That would make the frequency of this image 2 beats per minute, which is pretty slow, but if we increase the frequency, or BPM, then our wavelengths would be shortened, making them run faster. If we had an effect with a frequency of 60 BPM, then we'd have 60 waveforms over the interval of a minute, and we'd complete one waveform every second. Now let's take a look at how the MA is going to apply this waveform. Every wave is applied directly to a DMX channel. So imagine that this vertical line represents DMX values between 0 at the bottom and 255 at the top. As we travel along this waveform, we start right in the middle at 128, 
and roll up to 255 at our crest, then down to zero at our trough and back up to 128 before we continue on to the next waveform and do the same thing again. If this was a dimmer channel, then we'd output a value of zero intensity at the bottom of the wave and 100% or full at the top. And our resting position value in the middle is 50%. So our intensity would be traveling from 50% up to full, down to zero and back to 50 again. This time, let's assume that this is a pan channel with 540 degrees of pan functionality. So our low DMX value of zero would be negative 270 degrees. Our resting point would be zero degrees. And at the top end of our DMX channel would be the other end of pan at positive 270 degrees. So our light would pan from zero all the way one direction, then all the way the other direction and so on. Now that we've got the basics down, let's take a look at how we can manipulate these waveforms in the effect editor. We're going to use a lot of dimmer effects as examples because I think it's easiest to follow the math between 0 and 100. Right after our form selection, these three speed settings are going to affect the frequency of our waveform. The rate and speed columns can be thought of as the same thing since they're directly linked. Changing one changes the other. Remember that our speed in beats per minute is the number of times the waveform will run in a minute. In this intensity effect, 20 BPM would mean that our lights will cycle between full and zero 20 times in one minute. Speeding this up increases our frequency, so we would see more transitions between zero and full in the space of one minute. Depending on the speed, some channels can't create the full waveform at higher speeds because of physics. Maybe an LED cell could run an intensity effect with a really fast BPM correctly, but a unit with physical shutters probably can't. And trying to run a really fast BPM on pan and tilt on a moving headlight is going to be almost impossible. The pan and tilt channels won't be able to make it the full distance of the range, so you end up with a smaller looking effect. Remember when we were looking at our waveform and talking about how frequency can also be expressed in Hertz? Well, if you prefer to think in Hertz instead of BPM, you can change the default speed unit in the setup menu under user, settings, and then find speed mode. And while we're talking about MA specific options, this speed group cell allows you to change the speed or rate value of your effect using an executor. This can be fun when you have to busk a show and you want to gracefully ramp up or down between speeds of running effects. Some people prefer to use the learn button to tap in BPM speed, but knowing that not all channels can keep up with fast BPMs, I kind of like moving the executor and watching what the lights are really doing to find a speed that syncs up to the music. One of the things I always like to say is that even if the math is perfect, if it doesn't look or feel right on stage, it's wrong. Imperfect math is real life. For the direction cell, you can either picture flipping the waveform, or imagine that we're changing the direction we follow over it. The carrot forward is our normal direction, and we can see that the dimmer values are rolling over our selection from stage right to stage left. And if we invert the carrot, they now look to go stage left to stage right. There's also the bounce options that make this effect look like it's running stage right to stage left, then stage left to stage right, and so on. On our waveform diagram, you can think of the low and high cells as the trough and the crest. They constrain the waveform between two points. You probably already know that these high and low cells can reference two presets to move between, but this video is all about math, so let's see how that works with simple values. This dimmer sine wave effect is an absolute effect, which means the values at low and high will equal our dimmer output, in this case going between zero and full. If I change these to 25 and 75, the dimmer outputs remain exactly between those two values. Keep in mind, we're really just setting two points on the waveform. The lesser value doesn't have to be in the low cell. You can absolutely invert these numbers. We're not gonna see a difference if you invert these on this effect, but this is gonna come back into play later in this video in places where the difference will definitely be seen. If you set a value outside of what the channel can do, for example, setting the high to 200%, then your waveform would be trying to double the output of your light, which the light obviously can't do. So the result is that it will hold at the highest value it can do for the entire period that the waveform is outside the physical limits of the light. At this point, 
your waveform output isn't exactly linear looking anymore, and it means that you'll get an effect that seems to hold the full value longer than the zero value. But if you want to trick the light into holding at a high or low value for a longer period of time, sometimes this can be useful. That was an absolute effect. These cells are going to work a little bit differently with a relative effect. Most people are familiar with using relative position effects, which allow you to throw on an effect and change the starting point of the movement. I call that starting point the base value of the channel. Let's try our dimmer sine wave as a relative effect that runs our intensity between 0 and 50%. So now the console is going to apply the low and high values relatively to the base value. The number in these cells is important. A value of zero in the low cell of a relative effect means that we'll use the base value already on our channel as the low point. So if my lights start off at zero and I hit this effect, then they run between zero and 50%. If I change the base value to 50%, then my resulting effect runs intensity between 50 and full. If you change the number in the low cell, it will offset the base value of your channel by a percentage of that channel. So if our base value was 50% and I change this to minus 10, then it's gonna subtract 10% from our base value and our effect will run between 40% and full. If I change it to 25, our effect would run between 75 and full. Same idea with the high value. Say I set this to 40. So now I'm limiting my high value to 40% above my base value and the effect now runs between 75 and 90. There is another way to look at this. Let's reset our settings to a low value of zero, a high of 100, and set our fixture's base value to zero. If we click the option in the bottom right and change our value readout to center and size, you can see that the column headings have changed and the value in the center cell, the one that was low, is now 50. Let's take a look at our waveform, and we can imagine center as the location of the horizontal line, our resting position, running in the middle of the waveform. At 50, it places that line and the wave exactly in the middle. If I set it to 60, it's like moving the entire sine wave up and the top end slightly out of range of the DMX channel. If we lowered our size, it's like adjusting the crest and trough points simultaneously. So if I lower the size down to 80%, I've essentially subtracted 10% off each crest and trough, and now our effect runs between 20% and full. If that math is confusing, then start with your effect centers at 50 and play with the size cell only until it clicks. If it's easier to work with a high and low instead of center and size, go with that instead. There's no right or wrong. More than one person has asked me how to write a CMY effect that you could use to roll from any color into white and back to that color again. They didn't want to have to write a new effect for every color in their color pool. A relative effect with a high value that sets the lights to white makes this no problem, and you don't even need to use a preset, unless of course you want to be specific about the color that is white. In this effect, I'll leave the color mixing effect line's low value at zero and set high to 100. Since it's relative, that low value will be whatever base value I already have on the channels. With our high value at 100, it will take all the channels to their highest value, which makes the color white, so this effect will always go to white from any starting point of color. I know what some of you are thinking right now. If I took all of my CMY values and set them at 100, I'd get color black, not white. And you would be absolutely correct. But that's not exactly the math that we're doing here. In our effect, the attributes are actually RGB. And since red, green, blue are the inverse of CMY, a value of 100 on these channels would equal a value of zero on CMY, thus white. So I can leave this effect running and switch to different color presets, and you'll see that we can pick any color to go back and forth to white. That's the beauty of a relative effect. Depending on what kind of attributes your lights have, you may need to add additional lines for channels like amber if you've got RGBA fixtures, or white for RGBW, but the concept is the same. Another thing I like to use high and low for is if I've got a movement effect that's maybe a little too big, like let's say that it's hitting the video wall. If I tweak the high and low cells, I can work with that until the size is low enough that I'm off the wall. And if you want to play with this some more, try setting a range of values for lows and highs. It'll spread those values out over your fixture selection. 
phase on a waveform runs zero to 360 degrees over one complete waveform. And you can think of the phase assigned to each light as that light's starting point on a waveform. For example, in our dimmer effect, we have six lights and the phase is assigned zero through 360, which is the console's way of spreading out our light's starting point evenly over the wave. If we set the phase of all of our lights to the same value, then they all have the same starting point and they run the effect in unison. Spreading these starting points out gives us more of a dynamic look. Let's take a look at how the console determines the starting points over that zero through 360 range. It does mean that the first light's phase will be at zero, but the last light in our selection is not actually gonna be at 360. So why doesn't it put that last one at 360? Remember how that zero to 360 range ran across the space of one waveform? That means when the next waveform starts, 360 and zero are at the same place. That would put the first unit in our selection at essentially the same phase point as the last unit in our selection. So they'd be doing the same thing instead of having an even spread. To prevent that, the math that the console is actually doing is it's dividing 360 by the number of units in your selection and spreading them out by that value. For example, we have six lights in this effect. 360 divided by six is 60, so the first light has a phase value of zero, the second a phase value of 60, and that increment continues up to our last unit at a phase value of 300, which is exactly 60 degrees from the end of the phase and the start value of zero in the next waveform. You don't have to use zero to 360 to spread out the look of the effect. Try using zero to 180 or even less to see how starting the phase of each light earlier changes your effect. And you can also go above 360. That doesn't change how the console treats the degrees of the waveform. It's more like moving your starting points over multiple waveforms. If we double the phase to zero through 720, that would be like spreading out our starting points over two waveforms. On our fixtures, that results in two ripples of our dimmer effect over our selection instead of one. And if you've noticed negative options like zero to negative 360, those will spread out our starting points using the same math, but just in the opposite order. Again, you can also think of this as flipping the waveform. There's also three offset phase waveforms built into the desk. If you've ever used the predefined RGB rainbow, then you were using these three forms. See how each phase is offset evenly? They're each 120 degrees off from each other. That means we don't even have to change the phase cells because it's built into the form. That offset between our three color attributes is what makes this a rainbow and not just a cycle between white and color black. Width will actually compress the width of the complete waveform, and it's easiest to see how this is being handled in the editor. If I shorten this sine wave effect by setting the width to 50%, the wave will run completely in half of the time of our beat, then pause at this middle value for the other half of our beat. Visually, this sometimes ends up looking a little steppier. Let's try it again with a cosine form instead, and also with a width of 50. Instead of sitting at the middle range of my channel for half the beat, I'm now spending that time at the high value of my waveform, so my result is that we're seeing more lights on than off, and for longer. Ever have a designer ask you for more negative space in an effect? That means that they want to see more lights off than on, and using width is one quick way to get there. Right now, we have the opposite. We have too many lights on because we're spending half the beat at our high value. Remember when we were talking about high and low values and I said that you could invert them? If I set the high value to be zero and the low value to be full, then we'll end up with more time at a value of zero, thus more negative space. Want even more time off? Just decrease the width. The attack and decay options work with three of our forms, pulse width modulator, random, and chase. And these three forms look the same. The difference is chase removes the width option so everything stays even, like a chase. Random removes the phase option to keep everything, well, random. But PWM, that form doesn't get any restrictions, so let's work with that. You don't usually want to start this form with a width of 100. That would result in a straight line and no changes. Starting at a width of 50 gives us an even spacing between our high and low. Unlike some of the other forms we use today, pulse width modulator has no curve. We can go between our high and low, 
But instead of a curved wave where we're running through values with smooth acceleration, by default, here we snap to our high value, spend some time there, and then snap to our low value, spending some time there as well. If you want to have some crossfade on this change, then that's where attack and decay come in. As I add some attack, you can see the change in the waveform and also see that the dimmer is fading to full, but still snapping to zero because decay is still at zero. Now with attack and decay both at 50, we get an even crossfade and equal amounts of time at the high and low value. Next, if we play with width and we lower it, we spend more time at the low value, 0% in our case, giving us more negative space. But look at what happens if we raise the width. We eventually get to a point where we lose the decay completely and we're back to the light snapping off. So what if you like the look of that smaller width, but again, you wanted the opposite, more lights on than off. Then let's go back to that small width and then we just swap the high and low values. When you're using attack and decay and adjusting the speed, remember that speed is increasing the waveform frequency and that has a direct effect on attack and decay. As I speed this up, I start to lose my crossfade between high and low, so just be aware of that. After attack and decay, our next three options are all about how the effect is gonna to apply to our fixture selection. As with all things on the console, your initial fixture selection order is everything. The next three options will run their math based off that selection, whether it was a linear order or a shuffled one. A group set to one will treat all the units as if they were the same, and they'll run the effect in unison, even if you've set a range in phase. A group of none would give us an even spread over our phase. But if we set this to groups of two, the math assigns just two points of phase, and we get an odd and even looking effect. A group of three treats every first light the same as the fourth light, and the seventh, and so on, like an interleave. And you can do a group of a higher number than the count of fixtures in your selection. If I set this effect for six lights to a group of 12 with a phase of 0 through 360, it's like I've just cut that phase in half. Our blocks work just like they do in our M matrix. They combine fixtures of our selection to work as one. This block of two sets my first two lights to work as one, the next two lights as a pair, and so on. Wings plays with our waveform over our selection. For example, a wing of two is dividing our lights into two groups and flipping the direction of the waveform for our second group. The result makes our effect look symmetrical. A wing of three would divide our selection into three groups. Let's take a look at this effect with 15 lights. The first five runs our waveform forward, the second runs it in reverse, and the third runs it forward again. It's not symmetrical, but you can see how the pattern is taking shape. A wing of four divides our selection into four groups and flips our waveform for the second and fourth group, so an even numbered wing can appear symmetrical. There's also negative wings. We've already seen a wing of two. If I change this to a negative wing of two, it still splits our selection in two with the second group running the waveform in the opposite direction, but then also inverts the high and low values for that second group. If some of this stuff is starting to feel like the options from our matrix editor, you're right. In fact, if you have a set of align groups, blocks, or wings already in that editor that you want to use, you can click take a matrix and they'll be applied. It was easiest to show how that math worked with a linear selection of lights. But like I said, if you start with a shuffled selection, then your results are always gonna be a bit more random. And there's actually a middle ground that combines randomness with a more controlled selection. I like to call this organized chaos. Let's take a look at some dimmer effects over multi-channel units. First, I've got a row of JDC1s running a dimmer effect that was built by selecting my cells in order. Now I want to change it so that I see each group of JDC cells running the effect together instead of spread over the entire row. Since I selected these in order, I can change my blocks to 12 and I get the waveform running on each unit one at a time. That effect looks pretty organized. This time, for a more chaotic look, I've taken the same settings from that effect, but I shuffled the selection of my cells when I set the quantity. Now if I change this to a block 12, it still looks pretty random. The math is the same, it's just being applied in a different selection order. And now for an example of that organized chaos that I mentioned, 
I want to go back to that first effect where I selected them in order and then applied the block. Now I'll hit shuffle selection order and the order will be shuffled with respect to the block I already applied. So I'm getting a random order over my blocks of cells instead of individual cells. The last option in the window has nothing to do with changing the selection math. If single shot is set to yes, this option tells the waveform to run once and then stop. Here's a pulse width modulator effect over those JDCs that rolls the intensity over the row just once. I've played with the phase, width, attack, and decay until I got the effect that I wanted. I kind of can't believe you made it to the end of this video. I'm impressed. If your brain isn't too fried yet and there's something that didn't quite click, try playing with these effects and editing those cells and definitely try different attributes. Try mixing up different waveforms over different phases with different selections of lights. Experimenting can really be the best way to learn. So until I see you next time, thanks for watching.